A few months ago, I created a WebSocket server on an ESP32 and used it to send messages back and forth to my computer. Feel free to look at that video if you need a refresher. This time, let's use WebSockets to control actual hardware on the ESP32. We'll start by connecting some hardware to the ESP32. I'll use an LED as a basic example. Next, we write an Arduino sketch that turns on the soft access point on the ESP32, runs a basic web server that responds to HTTP requests and serves up a simple HTML file, and finally runs a WebSocket server that responds to WebSocket requests. This sketch will be compiled and run on the ESP32. We'll upload our HTML document directly to the ESP32 using the Serial Peripheral Interface Flash File System, or SPIFS for short. This HTML page will be very simple, something with some text, a button, and a basic graphic to show the state of the LED. It will instruct the browser on our phone or computer to connect to the ESP32's WebSocket server and send WebSocket messages whenever the button is pressed. When the sketch runs, it will turn the ESP32 into an access point, which broadcasts a Wi-Fi SSID. We'll use our phone to connect to the Wi-Fi access point and then request the index.html page. The ESP32 will respond by sending over the HTML page, which the phone's browser will render. Part of this page will include some JavaScript that will instruct the phone to immediately connect to the ESP32's WebSocket server as soon as the page loads. Then, whenever we press the button on the page, it will send a WebSocket message to the ESP32. The ESP32 will interpret this message and toggle our LED. To start, let's connect an LED to pin 15. I'm using an Adafruit Feather Huzzah 32, but most other ESP32 boards should work. We'll use a 330 ohm limiting resistor. To upload files to the SPI Flash file system, we need a special Arduino plugin. Go to github.com, Mino Dev, Arduino ESP32FS plugin. Go to the releases page and download the latest zip file. Unzip that file and navigate into the folders to find the ESP32FS.jar file. Copy that .jar file. Go to your Arduino's installation directory and go into the tools folder. Create a new folder named ESP32FS in all capital letters. In there, create another new folder named tool in all lowercase letters. Place the .jar file into this new tool folder. Restart Arduino and look in Tools in the menu bar. You should see ESP32 sketch data upload. This tells you that you've installed the SPIFS uploader correctly. Back in GitHub, click on MinoDev's username to see a list of their repositories. We'll need the ESP async web server to help us respond to HTTP requests. Download the zip for that repository. In Arduino, go to Sketch, Include Library, Add .zip library. Import the ESP async web server zip file to load the library into Arduino. To make ESP async web server work with our ESP32, we need to install async tcp. Perform the exact same steps to download the zip file and import it as a library into Arduino. In a new sketch, include the Wi-Fi and SPIFS libraries, which should come with the ESP32 package we installed in the first video. We also include the ESP async web server that we just installed, and we also include the WebSocket server which we installed in the first video as well. We'll create a bunch of constants. First, we need to give our access point an SSID and password. Anything silly will do, as long as you can remember the strings. We'll store a couple of strings that we will use as messages to send across the WebSocket connection. Finally, we'll set our DNS, HTTP, and WebSocket ports followed by the pin number that's connected to the LED. We need a few global variables for this sketch, so we save the web server and WebSocket server as different objects. We'll save any incoming WebSocket messages in this 10-character buffer. We'll also remember the state of the LED so that we can send it as a message to our client. Because this sketch can be quite long, I like to divide up my sections with large, obvious comments. I'm not quite at the point where I would use separate files, but almost. Most of the web server and WebSocket server code happens asynchronously, which means we need to write a series of callback functions. We'll start with the WebSocket event. This function is called if there's any type of WebSocket activity. The caller will provide us with a type, which we'll use to figure out how we need to respond. If the client disconnects, we'll just print it to the console and not do anything else. If we have a new client connecting, we'll figure out the IP address of the client and print that to the console. Next, we have a text type. We first print it to the console. If it's equal to our toggle LED string, we actually toggle our attached LED. 
Otherwise, it's likely a get LED state message. If so, we send out our own WebSocket message with the ASCII character 1 if the LED is on, or ASCII 0 if it's off. There should not be any other WebSocket messages we can receive, but just in case, we'll print any unrecognized messages to the console. For all other types of WebSocket events, we won't do anything. We'll need to write our web server callbacks next. We start with our main HTTP request for a web page, which will respond by sending them index.html located in the spiffs directory. I'll include the callback for a .css request here just so you can see how it's done. We won't need a style.css file as we're just going to do everything in HTML and JavaScript. However, you are welcome to upload a style.css file with your index.html to spiffs if you want a prettier web page. In case we get a request for a web page that doesn't exist, we'll want to send a 404 error back to the browser. In setup, we initialize the LED and make sure it starts off. We also open up the serial port so we can send debug info to the console. After that, we initialize the spy flash file system. If it fails, we'll print an error message and then purposely hang the processor. If spiffs works, we'll start the access point with the SSID and password we set earlier. Once it's up, we print out our own IP address to the console, which we'll need to know for our HTML file. Then we start assigning callbacks. If we get an HTTP request for the root directory, we will respond by running the onIndex request function we wrote earlier. In it, we send the requester our index.html file. Similarly, if they request a style.css file, we run the onCSS request function and send style.css, assuming we have one in our spiffs directory. Finally, we tell the server to call onPageNotFound if we get a request for a page or resource that we don't have. After that, we start the WebSocket server and assign the onWebSocket event function as our callback. The only thing we have to do after that is to call WebSocket.loop within our loop function. This ensures that events are handled when they arrive. Let's upload this to our ESP32. Note that it's important to name and save our sketch, as we'll need the folder structure for uploading spiffs files. I'll call mine ESP32 WebSocket host. Once you're done compiling, open a console and look for the IP address of the ESP32. You might need to press the reset button on your ESP32 board to get this information to appear. Copy it or write it down. Note that this is the default address given by the soft AP function. Go to Sketch, Show Sketch Folder, which should open the location of your Arduino sketch on your computer. Create a new directory in the sketch folder named Data, all lowercase. The folder must be named this, as when we use the spiffs uploader tool, it will look in this Data directory for files to send to the ESP32. In Data, create a new file named index.html. Open index.html with your favorite editor. At the top, declare the doc type as HTML and set the character set to UTF-8. These are pretty standard tags at the beginning of most HTML files. We'll give the page a title, like WebSocket Test. We'll then open our JavaScript tag and begin writing our WebSocket handler. The address of the WebSocket server is the IP address of the ESP32 that we copied earlier along with the WebSocket port number that we set in the Arduino sketch. We'll also declare a few variables to help us control the web page. To set up the page from JavaScript, we create a callback function, which we'll call init. In it, we get the page elements and then use the HTML canvas element to draw a basic circle. At the end, we call a function named wsConnect that we're about to write. In that function, we create a new WebSocket object using the IP address of the ESP32 and port number of the WebSocket server. We'll also assign all of our callbacks here that help handle WebSocket requests. In the first callback, when we first make a WebSocket connection, we output to the browser's console and enable the button. We then send the string get LED state to the ESP32. If the WebSocket connection closes, we log it to the console and disable the button on the page. We also set a timer, which will attempt to re-establish connection with the WebSocket server in about two seconds. If we receive a WebSocket message, we print the message contents to the console and parse it. If we receive the character zero, it means that the server was telling us the LED is currently off. So we log it to the console and update the circle on the web page to mimic the state of the LED by filling it with the color black. If it's a one, it means the LED is on. 
So we log that and update the circle by filling it with the color red. If it's a message we don't recognize, we'll just ignore it. We don't expect any WebSocket errors, but just in case we get some, we'll log it to the browser's console so we can see what's going on. We called do send earlier, so we need to actually write that function. We'll log what we're sending to the console and then use the WebSocket object to send whatever string we pass to the function. Finally, we need to handle the toggle button push, so we write this on press function. All we do here is send the string toggle LED to the ESP32, followed by the get LED state string requesting the current state of the LED. Even though we wrote the init function earlier, we need to assign it to our window. We tell it to call init as soon as the page loads. Finally, we can close out our script tag. Now we can actually build the web page. We'll give it the title LED control. We'll make a simple table that puts our button next to the canvas circle that shows us the LED's status. I added this output div to help me with debugging, so you don't really need it. Save your HTML file and exit out of your editor. Back in Arduino, go to Tools and click ESP32 Sketch Data Upload. This might take a couple of minutes, so wait while the plugin uploads your index.html file to the spiffs directory on the ESP32. It does this over the serial port, so make sure you don't have the Arduino serial console open when you're trying to upload to spiffs. Once that's done, your ESP32 server is complete. With your phone or computer, connect to the ESP32's access point. Enter let me in please as the password. You might get an error telling you there's no internet access, but that's okay. My Android phone makes me click through a pop-up where I have to tell it to stay connected to this internet-less access point. Bring up a browser and enter the ESP32's IP address, which is 192.168.4.1. You should see a simple circle and button. Feel free to zoom in to make it easier to see. Press the button and the LED should turn on. Press it again and the LED should turn off. Notice that the circle also changes color to match the state of the LED. Even if we turn on the LED and refresh the page, the browser asks the ESP32 for the state of the LED as soon as the page loads, so it should not lose the LED's state. This might seem like an overly complicated way to send messages between a browser and an ESP32, but it is one of the fastest ways that I've found to control hardware over Wi-Fi, as WebSockets seem to have very little overhead. The LED is really just a starting point. Feel free to take this to the next level and make internet-connected sensors and robots. Happy hacking!